Dr. Temple Grandin, thank you for talking with us today. Um, I'm a member of the autism community myself, and I have really looked forward to being able to talk to you about some questions that I've had and other teams, okay. other young adults have had as well. Okay. Um, so my first question is from Savannah in South Carolina, and we broke her question down into a couple different topics to help make conversation a little bit easier. Um, her first question is, will you talk about sensory processing and the brain and how early intervention of identification of sensory issues can help a person? Well, sensory issues are real. And in kids, sometimes noise sensitivity can be reduced by taking the thing they hate, like the vacuum cleaner, and letting the child turn it on and off where they control it. That can sometimes help. Now, another problem I have is, uh, processor speed on chit chat conversations where people are talking back and forth kind of chit chat usually doesn't have much content but they're having such a fabulous time i can't follow it and if i'm in a noisy restaurant i'm kind of functionally deaf you see that that's processor speed problems so then i tend to look at the tvs that are often up there just you know signs on the wall for someone struggling with sensory issues, how would you recommend they try to manage them when they need to function in a public setting? Okay, that's way too vague. I've got to have more information on what the sensory problem is. Now, in a lot of public settings, noise is an issue. Now, the problem is, if you wear a headset all the time, your hearing sensitivity will get worse. I know everyone's had wax in their ears, and then when the doctor takes the wax out, it sounds loud. That's because the brain has tried to compensate for the wax. And so it's okay to have a, the headphones for some really noisy restaurant, but other times you wanna to try to take them off. Otherwise you get more sensitive. And there's some individuals that it can be very tiring to be in those places. You need to have breaks, just get out and have a break. Uh, another issue is lighting problems. There are some individuals, I'm not one of them, but there's some individuals that have very serious problems with seeing flicker on fluorescent lights, which are being phased out, but some of the cheap uh, LED lights flicker. And that's making a room flash on and off like a strobe light. And that can be really terrible. If that's in a classroom, that is one thing that has to be fixed. You know, like maybe get your desk over by the window, uh, change the lights in the classroom, but I, I want to know specifically what the problem is. Those are just two of the most common problems. This person didn't share the sensory issues specifically. Well, those are, those are the most common ones, so. Okay. Um, next, Hannah from Albuquerque asked, when someone experienced bullying as a child, how do you recommend working through that? And to follow up, did you experience bullying? Um, and for your differences and how did you manage to work through that? Well, in elementary school, I was not bullied because my teacher, Mrs. Teach, explained to the other children that I had a disability that was not visible, like a wheelchair, and they need to help me. So high school is horrible, absolutely horrible. And the only places I was not bullied was um, friends who shared interests, which was horses, electronics, and model rockets. That's why I want to encourage things. You know, I had one mom say that, her kid's doing super well at this school and loves marching band. You see, that's an example of something where there's a shared interest. And then there's some kids that are bullied so bad in high school, you just take them out, it's illegal, I want them working, and then finish up the high school degree. You see, I, I know people that own gigantic shops, 20 paths. I uh, barely graduated from high school. Thanks for the welding class. Uh, Sage from Arkansas has a question about reducing stigma about autism in higher education. In a class, a professor required a reading for the curriculum that called autism a disease and spoke of the need for it to be cured. But the professor also knew that there was someone in the class on the spectrum who was receiving accommodations and also doesn't feel that people on the spectrum should receive accommodations. Well, so first of all, I would well, deal with them. I would tell them that Elon Musk is on the spectrum. I'm living in a boxable right now, sold all his fancy mansions. And Einstein was probably autistic. Steve Jobs was probably autistic. 
And these are all people that care about what they do. And and autism and its mildest forms just personality vari variation. And there's a point where you might have to go to the disabilities office. Um, now, when you talk about accommodation, that's too vague. Okay, the one accommodation that I needed, maybe a little tiny extra time on math tests. I had tons of math tutoring, tons. And the big mistake that I see students make is when they flunk the first quiz, they don't ask for help soon enough. That's the big mistake that's made. And if there's a problem with the lighting, you, that also some individuals, dyslexia will have that problem. Also head injuries can cause some of the same sensory problems as autism. And if you're in a room with lights that flash, that has to be fixed. So some and, so, I, and what was this one what course this professor taught? Uh, it was a communications course, but I think some professors wrongly believe that if a person has the ability to be in college, then you should not be giving them any kind of accommodations or modifications. Yeah, and that's, um, okay, we have ramps for wheelchairs. That's an accommodation. And I have um, uh, processing speed issues. I, I actually became a very good note taker. And they used to say to me in math class, well, why do you take all these notes? And I couldn't do it if I didn't take all the notes. And that's one professor. No, it, that doesn't, that's not the whole college. You know, and that's bad. I'm, I'd probably be sending him uh, articles about Elon Musk. Did I send emails with links to the Elon Musk Saturday Night Live videos. He might be getting those. <laughs> um, so can you speak um, to schools of higher education and professors of how this negative stigma of autism, how this affects the students on the spectrum and that are constantly being called out for needing their accommodations, how this kind of affects them in their college experience and their tradition to adulthood? We're well, asking a lot of abstract stuff. <laughs> uh, one of the things that really motivated me is I wanted to prove I wasn't stupid. And that was the big motivation when I did those dip bed projects. Um, and I, that's why in my talks, I talk about Elon Musk, I talk about Einstein, I talk about Steve Jobs, uh, Bill Gates. Well, these are some very successful people that are on the fully verbal end of the spectrum. Um, I've always thought Elon Musk was autistic but, uh, after I read Ashley Vance's book about him. But I couldn't, but now that he's announced it publicly and then the sale of the houses is color spread in the Wall Street Journal. So I can uh, talk about uh, something that's plastered all over the Wall Street Journal. So this next question is actually mine. So I'm actually working on my master's and I hope to do my PhD one day, but right now I'm kind of recovering from all the stress that is the master's process. But something I experienced a lot of difficulty with is I wasn't able to get my professors to understand that while I have a high IQ and while I can do the work, I'm on the, spe the spectrum and I struggle with sensory issues and anxiety and making deadlines. Um, specific example was my professors were not following the academic gu guidelines. But all, right, all right, tell me specifics. My mind works in specifics. What was a specific problem? The specific problem was I was asked to get something to them by a certain date, but they did not give me the information and they would not meet the deadlines. Like, so if they said they would send me something in an email on this date at this time, I would maybe get it two weeks later, but still expected to have something on their desk with that. Right, so in other words, okay, wait a minute now. So the problem is, um, this is a, this is material they had to give you so you could write a paper. Mm -hmm. This was like for a journal article you were doing for your right. master's? Yes, ma'am. And so you're like you're like an author. Uh, if you're a master's, you'd be the first author on the paper. I like to talk in total specifics. And so you have other people you're collaborating with, like maybe this is the statistics person, for example, and he didn't get his stuff in. Mm -hmm. Okay, what I do in that situation is um, all my part of the paper, I get it done. And then I'll just leave up blank space where that maybe the stats stuff goes in 
well, my stuff is done. And the other thing that I learned to do on projects, big projects, we're doing plant remodels, is I made very clear what my part of the project was. Like I would design up until a certain rail switch, for example. Okay, can I have the field next door to build my project? Yes or no? Very clear my part of the project. And then I got it done on time. So if somebody else on the team didn't get the statistics done, for example, I'm not doing that. Don't play me. And then I document. I have done the methods and materials. I've written the lit review. Um, I've written up some discussion because we got some preliminary data and I still have not received the statistical analysis. Email, document, document. That's how you do it in business. It's that simple. What advice would you give to people on the spectrum who are trying to work with people who don't understand autism as a whole because they don't understand? Right, that's way too vague. Way, way too vague. Um, they now I can remember when I was at the University of Illinois, one of the professors thought I was stuck up because I didn't say hi in the corridor. OK, that's where you guys, the psychologists, need to coach the autistic person that they need to do some little social nice niceties in the corridor. Because they've got to learn like being in a foreign country. You coach them on that. But you see how specific I'm getting as a visual thinker. I'm now seeing the corridor in an old building, an animal science lab at the University of Illinois. And I'm seeing a corridor by the departmental office. See, nothing is, is you see, verbal thinkers overgeneralize. But we're going to get a lot better at solving these problems at looking at the specific problem. Okay, the specific thing that I would, accommodation I wish that was a little extra time on math tests, the tutoring I got on my own when I failed the first quiz. And I always remind people about Elon Musk and Einstein and Steve Jobs and, and people, you know, people like that. Michelangelo was probably autistic. 12 year old dropout, dirty little slob, thought it was funny to borrow some pen and ink art, copy it, and then give the owner back the copy and get away with it. But fortunately, little Mikey got exposed to great art because the churches were commissioning him. And he was exposed to stone cutting tools. Okay, see how important that is. Then the mentoring came in later. I had a fabulous science teacher, fabulous. Really important mentor. And there's professors out there that will help you. Try to seek out the professors that will help you. There were some, when I switched from psychology to animal science, Philip Stiles, a poultry specialist, he taught animal science 100, helped me switch majors. And I had to take his course for no credit because I was switching majors because it was animal science 101. It was a freshman class. I, But there are professors that will help you. Seek them out. You know, for every professor that's a jerk, there's five others that will help you. Um, for those who on on our, for those who are on the spectrum and want to pursue graduate work, what would be one of the first things that you would suggest to them before they even begin the process? Well, let's look at what you want. Uh, I'm going to say this to any student: What's the goal? What do you want to? Do you want to become a doctor? Do you want to become a researcher? See, a lot of graduate research trains you to be a researcher. You know, because in a master's program, you have to do an original piece of research. I don't care what field you're in, it's true for all of them. Um, what do you want to be after you get this degree? I know in psychology, you've got to have certain degrees to practice clinical psychology. So if that's what you want to do, then you've got to get those degrees. I, I want to look at What's your dream job? What's the goal? I get there's certain places I wouldn't get an entry level job because, you know, for a long period of time because I couldn't advance. Like maybe some little small uh, grocery store. There's no place for advancement there. 
what is the goal? You want to be a clinical psychologist? Okay, that's a reasonable goal. Let's look at where are you going to be when school is done? What are you trying to accomplish? I thought I was going to be an experimental psychologist studying optical illusions. And I actually made that optical illusion room that was shown in the HBO movie. And I turned out designing meatpacking plants. Um, this next question is from Riley in Arizona. Um, their questions are more about careers and jobs. Her first question is, how do you navigate work when there are bad days and you feel like you can't function or you're having meltdown dysregulations? How can you well, balance? I had horrible, horrible panic attacks. I've been on medication for 40 years. I was just in the doctor's office. They had burned some little skin cancers off me. Well, Dr. Gnostic, they had the cleverest way to take the earpiece notoscope that, and squirt liquid nitrogen and burn off my little skin cancer off my hand. That's visual thinking. But when I was in my 20s, I had horrible panic attacks, horrible. I've since found out from brain scan that my fear center was uh, three times larger than normal. In this book, Thinking in Pictures, I have a chapter in here called A Believer in Biochemistry, where I describe my experience with antidepressant medication. I just got him to refill the prescriptions today, and it stopped the constant panic attacks. I've been on it for 40 years. A very, very low dose. The mistake that's made now with things like Prozac is too high a dose. Get too high a dose, you get agitation and insomnia. I would not have functioned without the antidepressants. I did the dip bat projects, but then my health was coming apart. Uncontrollable colitis, just completely terrible. And that cleared up about 90% going on the antidepressants because my nervous system no longer in a state of fear. And it's one tiny little drug, one tiny little med. And that's why the chapter is called Believer in Biochemistry. It, and, and now on the other hand, there's way too many drugs given out to children. There's way too many people on cocktails of garbage where very little thought went into it. That's totally bad. But on the other hand, one tiny little med, I don't think I would have gotten a PhD without that medication. Because my health would have deteriorated too much. And I and now I've on the second generic. I actually Google Earth one of the factories and communed with it and I said, please keep making this stuff. Please shipping containers come. <laughs> yeah. Because I can see the whole supply chain. Or maybe it goes by air cargo. That's necessary, very necessary. <laughs> but that's something that that this helped with some of the sensory stuff. And I know other people as adults that have gone a little tiny dab of Prozac and it made a huge difference. Just a tiny dab, a starter dose or less. And if you're interested, read it. I want you to read it in this book, Thinking in Pictures. So you get it the way I wrote it 25 years ago when I was much more recently had experienced it. Um, Riley's second question is, what tools or resources would you suggest to help make transitioning to work or trade school or higher education a better transition for those on the spectrum? Slow transitions are best. You don't want to jump off the service cliff. And so let's say you're in high school right now. Let's get a part-time summer job. So you've already got work skills if you're in high school now before you graduate from high school. If you're in college, Get involved with doing research projects. Volunteer off the help with research projects. Uh, get a part-time job in the summer. Try to get internships in, in, the, in the area of your career, whatever it's gonna be. Try on your career so that when you finally get out of school, you're already working. I was doing signs, painting signs for the Arizona State Fair Carnival when I was getting my master's degree, silly signs for stupid exhibits. And the way I got those jobs is I showed a portfolio of pictures of signs, but that taught such important working skills. That's what I'd recommend. You don't wanna just, you wanna start the transition to working before you graduate from college. I, I, I cannot emphasize that enough. 
slow transition from the world of school to the world of work. That's one of my basic principles. And then driving. Got to learn how to drive. It's going to take longer. I did 200 miles on dirt roads before I did any traffic. It was 20 minutes a day, three miles up to my aunt's mailbox, three miles back. And you've got to get the operation of the vehicle into autopilot, into muscle memory before you touch traffic. And you start out big parking lots, back country roads, totally safe places. If I hadn't learned to drive, I would not have had a career in the cattle industry. It's that simple. This next question is from an adult who wants to remain anonymous in North Carolina. And there is a little bit of a story behind this one because this is a specific example. So I just want to make, give you the context for this. Okay. An autistic individual moved to a new area and most of the neighbors were aware of his autism, but apparently one was not. He was having a hard time and was pacing back and forth on the sidewalk near his home, trying to calm himself down. But one of the neighbors called the cops and when they came, he wasn't able to speak to communicate what was going on with him when he dysregulated, he often cannot speak. He wasn't sure what to do. He even said he had a card that stated he was autistic or something in his pocket, but he was afraid of them shooting him thinking he was going to reach for a weapon. How would you suggest someone with autism communicate to the officers in that type of situation? Well, this can sometimes be, uh there'll be a problem because what happens and I've had some problems with this where you get into something you can just freeze you just freeze this has to do with processor speed one thing I've learned my computer is okay I want it to wake up I wiggle the mouse once and press one key now if I press the mouse like 10 times then the computer freezes and I won't wake up for five minutes you see that's sort of like the way an autistic person is it's like I have a huge memory and I can do all kinds of things, but I've only got one bar of service on the phone. You see, that's the slow processor speed. And and one of the things you need to be working on, and Texas actually is starting a good program where they have a card that says communication disorder, because you might learn a person who's deaf that, that can't speak. Um, and, uh, you know, th this, this is something that can be a problem. And, uh, you know, and one thing in a pre-rehearsal, okay, I, I like the pace because it calms me down. You could just say that. And uh, you see, then you get into the whole issue about medication. You've got one side that says, no, meds are evil. Then you've got another, another side where everything's just soused and drenched in meds. That's totally horrible. Well, I'm taking one little tiny med and I don't, I think I would have fallen apart in my mid thirties if I hadn't gone on that med. The other thing that helps is lots of exercise, bursts of hard exercise. I do a hundred sit-ups every night. I despise every one of them, but it helps me to sleep. Hard exercise. You got a membership in a gym. Okay, again, that's something where there's certain people you can chit chat with, but then you have to learn that you don't own the machine in the machines in the gym. And if somebody's on your favorite machine, you have to use a different machine or wait. See, that's something you just have to learn. But the hard exercise also helps. And and we also need to be working on training law enforcement. Um, on how to deal with someone when they just freeze. Do you have any specific recommendations on what law enforcement or community workers? Would... Well, was he was he doing? He, all he was doing was pacing. Yes, ma'am. All he was doing. That's not a crime. Pacing is not a crime. Wasn't yelling or. And, uh, you know, people lot sometimes call the police for things that are really stupid. Yeah. And then what ended up happening? Um, I think the situation ended okay, but his, um, his question came from a place of this might happen again because he might pace or stim or do something that makes somebody uncomfortable and they call the police. How, 
Part of his question too was, what do police officers need to know um, about autism or dealing with autistic members of the community when there isn't a law being broken, just someone's uncomfortable with what they're doing, how do they interact and build relationships? Well, one of the things you got to do, and it's the same thing you have to do with little kids when you're teaching them language. They're like a phone with one bar, one bar of service. So you have to give them time to respond. And that might be 15 seconds, 30 seconds. That's a long time. You have to like, you've got a phone on a bad connection. You're trying to look at a website. You've got to give that phone time to download that website, giving them time to respond. And if you get in their face, it's just like me pressing, uh, wiggling the, clicking the mouse too many times, trying to get the computer to wake up. It's the same thing. And I like these electronic analogies because I think people can understand that. And and uh, you see, and then if, the, if someone gets in their face, then it just gets worse. You know, the other thing you get into, well, how much should the autistic person adapt to society? Well, there's some things you have to do some adaptation. You can't be a rude, filthy, dirty slut. That's just not acceptable. Now, I dress kind of eccentric. Um, and I, uh, you know, there's some, you know, things like just having manners, saying please and thank you, things like that. There's no reason not to do those things. You have to do some conforming. People talk about masking autistic burnout. I think some of the burnout is untreated anxiety. Because when I read other people's descriptions of burnout, I go, wait, that sounds like me in my 20s. Um, and then following chit chat conversation, I simply can't follow it. It goes by too quickly. I can't process it. And the other thing I've done is um, I, I strongly recommend friends who shared interests. And it could be anything, movies, all, all sorts of things, friends who shared interests. Now this particular guy, um, um, this was an adult with an adult um, living in a community, it sounds like. And, but even he was afraid to like, because of the interaction with the police, he didn't want to put his hand in his pocket to get out a car. Well, I can understand that. And one of the things they instruct drivers, okay, it's like, put your hands on the wheel here where they can see your hands. And then, okay, then when they ask for your license, they're instructing people to do this. My license is in my backpack, it's in the back seat. And then the policeman could go get it if he wanted to, or do you want me to go get it? Um, in other words, my I have a special card that's in my pocket. In other words, you tell the officer what you're going to do. Okay, so being so you have a pre-rehearsed thing to do. That can really help. One more. Okay. Uh, this last one's actually from my dad. So Dan in Georgia, he coaches married men on the spectrum. And his question is, how can adults on the spectrum enlarge their capacity for anxiety? For example, getting overwhelmed easily can cause one to retreat. How can you enlarge your capacity so that you're not overwhelmed so easily? Well, again, it's very, very vague. Um, I got is, is it noise that's causing the overwhelming? Is it just too, uh, trying to follow too much chit chat conversation? You know, what exactly is the problem? Now you might find this book interesting, different not less, is 18 people, adults on the spectrum, all employed in jobs from doctors to tour guides. Um, and where the diagnosis helped these people, they were diagnosed later in life was with their relationships. I don't know how many times I've had wives come up to me and say, now I understand my engineer husband because they've read one of my books. Um, they, I, you see, in order to solve a problem, I got to know specifically where the problem is. I mean, to me, a really noisy restaurant, I just end up staring off in space and I don't hear most of the conversation. Or I end up talking to the person right beside me where I can carry on a little conversation with that one person. And and I sometimes just said, well, you know, I'm, I just can't hear them. There's a lot of background noise. That amount, I'll disclose that. 
I'm, Maybe in, a, but I, in order to help him, I need more specific examples of where he's getting overwhelmed. Maybe in a marital conversation, if the spouse is just even sensing or thinking conflict is going to happen or we're going to have a discussion about a topic, I don't want to have a topic. Like money, that's a big one. Right. The, uh, yeah, that's a big one. <laughs> yeah, that's a real big one. And and I I was talking to one, one lady uh, and, and one of the things this couple needed, I just problem solved, is they need to have some quiet time, like go to dinner, where there was no work stuff or just quiet time to be together. Where they get discuss stuff. They, they, um, the first thing is you have the spouse has to realize the person thinks differently and doesn't respond emotionally the same way. But it, it, it's hard to help answer a question when these are all very vague, they're very top down, typical verbal thinking questions. Whereas a visual thinker, I'm thinking specific examples. Here's a specific example of a job that worked. Here's a specific example chaotic clothing store at Christmas time for a teenage girl did not work. Just too much chaos and molly tasking. Now, that same store might have been fine not at Christmas time. See, that's specific. Uh, that was a job failure, actually. I talked to the mom, I talked to the daughter, and I said, no, that's a failure. i to give you a job that's a little less chaotic than that one. So, I, the see, my work. mind works in specific examples. Okay, jobs that work, jobs that don't work. Now, where marriages sometimes really work is a couple of computer programmers get together. <laughs> and they, I, I know a lady that, um, oh, you want to have a romantic dinner? Oh, we got to have white tablecloths, candles, everything, because we got to get ready for super romantic four hour conversation on computer data storage systems, because they are just so interesting. And then the other thing is like the, some of the spouses I talked to, you know, that, you know, about the engineer husbands, I, she says, now I kind of understand where he's coming from. So maybe a specific to help maybe the neurotypical spouse who might be more of a verbal processor and they are wanting to have a discussion with their engineer type neurodiverse husband, but they talk for 10 and 15 and 20 minutes and, and they're not getting engagement. What might the talking- Now you see there's a kind of an emotional engagement that the engineer husband's not gonna give them. That's just not where he's at. You see, that's the thing. I said, but if there's a fire, he'll save you. He'll go in a burning house to save you. That's how he'll show you you care. You see, my, my have a typical engineering mentality. Like people tell me about health problems and what's trying to figure out how to fix them. So as we close our time together, we've talked about a lot of different topics. What's um, the takeaway or the thing you want people to really get from our discussion together. You're, well, you're I want to see the, the people that are neurodiverse get out. I'm really into careers. You know, there's been a lot of discussion about identity first, autistic versus person with autism. I always used autistic, and then I was told it was wrong to use that. So then I did person with autism. Now I find out from advocates in the community, they'd rather use the word autistic, so I'm using that. And I used that on my very first book, Emergence Labeled Autistic, well, when you really think about identity, for me, it's career. It, it, it's uh, I, having an interesting career where I could improve an industry is something worth doing. And I get satisfaction in life when, when maybe a, a, a parent says to me, well, my kid's in college because your speech or your book or something like that. I was just over at Whole Foods shopping and and the lady came up to me and she said, well, five years ago, you gave me some advice for um, my kid and, and uh, it's been really helpful. You know, and I suggested getting her out doing things, always giving some choices and we don't shove them into multitasking messes because those don't work. But um, I relate to, I am what I do. And, and I, uh, and then it's just so much fun. The other day I was on a plane, I had a 
most fantastic flight the other day. I sat next to a lady who was a construction manager and we talked concrete forming for an entire flight. Tilt ups, how to brace them, just all kinds of stuff. That was a really good airplane ride. Concrete forming systems are super interesting. No, but that's uh, the sh shared interest thing. And we also talked about the ladies in the construction industry. And I'll tell you right now, being a woman starting out in the 70s in the cattle industry, much bigger barrier than autism ever was. Autism is almost a non-issue compared to being a woman. I had to be super good. I had to make myself really good at what I did. No, that was a much bigger barrier. Nope, we got to get out there and take the thing the kid's good at, build on it. Because even in the different, not less, there's one uh, paper in there written by a veterinarian and he was having problems in his marriage. And then he started saying, I started really getting a satisfaction from my career, you know, all the dogs and cats he worked with. And that was giving him satisfaction. You know, there's some things in life that I don't experience. But um, there's other things I do makes life really exciting and worthwhile. We've done a lot of consulting with major corporations, buyers right now. I've got to write a report up right now for a major buyer on some problems they had with a beef plant. And and somebody asked to be the level-headed person to say, hey, this is what we have to do about this. And I've got a video I've got to watch on a piece of new equipment right now. They're installing in a little tiny plant. I've got to, I've got to get on a conference call with them. And that's stuff I'm doing right now. It's still career stuff. And I also think it's, I also, people say, why don't you just give up all the science and all that stuff, just do autism stuff. Well, I think it's important to have a real job. And I'm realizing that career stuff really is my identity. That's the thing that I, if it's not for other people, like I'll put on the country music radio and it's all about the love life. I like the work songs better. <laughs> and, but I'm not saying that what I've done is for everybody, but I mean, Elon Musk is all about career. He sold all the fancy houses, plastered all over the Wall Street Journal. So he can do the things, rockets, space, electric cars, and he's an inner 10 year old. There's a special app on the Tesla under emissions. I'll leave it to you to find it. <laughs> inner 10 year old. <laughs> when I discovered that, I'll whack my head. <laughs> and it's total, but he's got a very successful career. Yes, he does. And he yeah. likes doing what he does. He says people underestimate manufacturing. I've watched a bunch of his videos. When he gives a tour of a factory, he loves his factory, loves it. I can relate to that. Well, uh, Dr. Temple, I wanted to personally thank you really quick. You said you like examples of uh, success stories. My mom mentioned earlier how she's heard you speak a bunch of times and I can, and she listened. And so if it wasn't for, you know, the loving push to make me go out and do things and the slow transition, um, from high school to college, I, That's the I thing to do with my, with my master's degree. I just well, I, good. And I want you to get your master's degree. And then when you get your master's degree, then you'll be able to do counseling. What, what are you planning to do when you get done with the master's degree? So I'm actually going to be into the museum field. My degree. Oh, oh okay. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Well, that's good. Um, and there's a lot of people on the spectrum that end up in museum things. And that's good. I thought you were a psychologist. Go into the museum field and, and do something and, and start doing some internships. I'm a big believer in trying on jobs. Too many parents have forced their kid to be a doctor or a lawyer and they hated it. It's really important to try careers on. So you do all this work to do a career. You don't want to do all this work to find out you don't like the career. 
I that's, think that's really career. important. But I started mine was more the, you know, an entrepreneur, one job at a time. You know, freelance. That's what I did. And the other thing you're going to have to learn is I don't care whether it's a museum or whether it's a factory. Uh, there's always a certain amount of bad stuff that goes on. Nothing is going to be perfect. I had to learn to tolerate a certain amount of nastiness that went on. And the thing is, in the good places, the good outweighs the nasty. But there is going to be some stupid, nasty things that uh, you have to learn to live with. And as long as the good outweighs it, then you stay with that company. Now, years ago in my employment, I, I, I ran advertising and I was asked to buy ads where I knew the company wasn't going to pay for them. I had to quit that job. That I'm not going to do. I draw the line at that. I'm not going to do stuff like that. that. That I have to quit. But there may be other things going on where you're better off just keeping the no your nose in your department and do a super good job. I'd also recommend printing out all of your evaluations in paper, kept at home in paper. So if something goes wrong, <laughs> you've got your portfolio. You've got your portfolio. Things disappear on the line. I recommend that to everybody. You always protect your portfolio. I, I, and no one and and you might be in a museum where something there's a might have to quit that museum my brother had to quit a job where he was asked to do some, some banking some stuff that shouldn't be doing he quit got another job so thing there's not gonna be about a certain amount of stuff where there's nothing's gonna be perfect there's always a certain amount of crap that goes on as long as the good stuff outweighs the crappy stuff and I made the mistake of being very black and white in the beginning. And you find out the world's not black and white. There's lots of gray. So you might have one professor that treated you really badly. What about your five other professors you've had? That's probably not true. See, then you got to decide, am I going to go to the disabilities department and cause some big agitation? And then they're going to hate you. It's not worth it. Might just drop his class because he's a jerk. <laughs> I like how you think. Definitely. That's um, because you've always got to remember what the goal is. What's the job at the museum that you want? Hopefully, what is museum education. That's what I really want. Okay. Any particular type of museum? I'm really open to anything. I love all areas of history. Put me in a time period, put me in a region, I'd be a happy person. Okay, so history, okay? History in general. Okay. Lots of museums in with stuff in history. I'm sure you'll be able to find a job in that. You put together some really good videos and things like that. Then you've got stuff in your portfolio, some really good presentations. Put up a LinkedIn page. And I think it goes back to something you said earlier for having ability to go to an internship at a really small museum where she got exposed to a bunch of different things from archiving to building a collection yeah. to new members to fundraising you know she got exposed to a bunch of different things and figured out what we like and what we don't like don't like Good. the archives <laughs> really don't like the archives i will do it you don't like the archives then you don't work there but the thing is you tried it and that's important i tell students the same thing it's also good to find out what you hate you said you hate the archives there'll be someone else on the spectrum who's going to love the archives you know, at least three. You, see, you don't know until you try it. And so I want to get students out doing all kinds of different things so you can see the kind of, you know, career you'd like to be in. Well, we appreciate this hour that you have given to us, Dr. Temple, and we know you have lots to do. Um, please come out here, Dr. Temple Brandon, at the Converge Autism Summit in South Carolina in April. Um, again, thank you so much for your time. Any anything else? I guess your your website, people, the books. Yep, I've got two Amazon. websites. I I got Temple Brandon, TempleBrandon.com. That's autism, and just Brandon. My last name is livestock. And I want to see these kids that are different get out, get into a, a career that they really like, because for a lot of people, career is really important. And. and, and uh, 
you know, I, I like teaching my class. It's going to be starting next a week from this Tuesday. All right, we'll end on that. I think our big takeaway thought is transitions, um, exposure, finding things that you like, finding the things that you don't like, and working your goal. I think that's a great summary. Well, that's of right, and and do the transition slowly. You know, with um, let's say you're in, let's say you haven't had a job, you're in college and you haven't had a job. Well, let's do some in, uh, some some summer jobs, even if you just did a grocery store one summer, just to pick up work skills. Right. You'll Works. be amazed at what you'll learn. All right, and that's our time with Ask okay. Tech for Simple. Bye, everyone. Okay, well, great to talk to you. Okay.